And one thing people forget, when you're up in exchange, you have two rooks against one. One incredibly effective method of, um, it's like the presidential convoy, you know, protection, the, the Secret Service rides in the back and rides in the front. Uh, and that's what you do with your two rooks. You put one in front of the pawn and one behind the pawn, which essentially guarantees full passage for the rook. So rook c4 is not the only move, and you could play rook e4 with tempo, but I want to show this concept. Okay, e4, we continue with e5. Oops, sorry for the board. All right, knight f3, knight c6. Let's see what he plays. This should be five. Okay, so let's play the main line. I, You know, there's many really uh, justly things for the gift. There's the Schliemann and stuff, but we're not there yet. So let's go a6. This is sometimes called the Morphe variation because I think Morphe was actually the first to, to play this move and talk about it. After bishop a4, we we go for the main line, which is knight f6. Now, here knight takes e4 is possible. Contrary to what a lot of people think, people think this pawn is poison. It is not. Knight takes e4 is a legitimate line called the open variation, and it's, in fact, incredibly popular at the highest level. But we continue down the main path, and that is bishop e7. And here white's main move is rook e1, but there's multiple alternatives. Okay. So now we go b5, and people want me to play the marshal. I will accept those demands. After b5, bishop b3, main move is d6. Um, and then white plays c3, castles h3. I'll talk a little bit about this after the game. But the point of the marshal is that we begin by castling. We don't push the d-pawn just yet. And the point is that after white plays c3, we play the immediate d5, sacrificing the pawn on e5. I think I have played the marshal once in a speedrun game, my first speedrun, but the guy plays an anti-marshal. Impressive that he knows it. A4 is what's considered, I think, the most dangerous line these days. It takes a lot of the sting out of the marshal, and it's an annoying move. It's what all the top guys play. Well, of course, the, the point is that A takes B5 is now a threat. This was featured in Magnus against Nepo. Black has three possible ways to defend against this. B4, which we're going to play. Rook B8, getting the rook out of the file. And bishop b7, the enkettoing the bishop. So, well, let's go b4. Let's play with sort of the most direct move, which is just to push the pawn forward. And here, white plays d4. That's the, the point is that white issues c3. It, it turns out, as people have discovered, that white doesn't even need to play c3. Because taking on d4 is not, not a good idea. It allows white to push that pawn down to e5. Uh, we have to defend the pawn on e5 by playing the move pawn to d6. And uh, a lot of people here take on e5. I believe that's the main continuation. There's also a5. Yeah, he takes on e5. Yeah, this guy knows theory. And, man, he's testing me. Because I will be honest with you guys, I don't remember if you're supposed to take with the knight or the pawn. I think you're supposed to take with the knight here. Yeah, I think you're supposed to take with the knight. The basic reason is that after taking with the pawn this construction is a little vulnerable uh, because the knight on c6 is no longer protected by a pawn. Yeah, this is theory. Okay, takes d8, and yeah, this is a, a popular endgame, which I honestly have no idea how to play. Of course, we take with the rook. This is what, where my theory, theoretical knowledge ends because I don't play the marshal, uh, so I'm not, not a specialist. So we'll, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out, hopefully. All right. So let's think. All right. Now, I feel like white wants to deploy this knight to c4. Uh, white wants to deploy this knight to c4. Um, and that's a pretty annoying idea. That's a, that's a pretty annoying idea. I am remembering something here. I am remembering something. Which is that, well, what can we do about it? We can't stop knight c4. Bishop e6 allows him to cripple our pawns. What we can do is we can try to discourage knight c4 by pressuring the e4 pawn, and that's bishop b7. Okay, instantly. <laughs> All right. He plays knight c4 anyway, of course. The point is bishop takes c4, knight takes c5. But in that position, if I remember correctly, white, uh, black can disarm 
this bishop by playing what move? By playing what move? Of course, this is hanging. Chris Velos. I still think this is theory, so nothing, nothing suspicious yet. Um, what should we do, guys? Bishop d5. Yeah, we have to drop the bishop back to d5 and contest the bishop on b3. Well, I mean, plenty of 1200s, no theory. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Imagine if you studied the line, um, you know, just by, by coincidence, and then you played it and was, people were accusing you of cheating. How would you feel about that? Um, yeah, usually 1200s don't know this, but that doesn't mean that if he knows this, we have to hold it against him. That's ridiculous. Um, it's unusual, and I have my eyes open, but there's nothing um, damning yet. Okay, so which way do we take, guys? Yeah, of course, rook takes. Knight takes, runs into the very nasty knight c6. We have to take with a rook to prevent that. And if knight c6 here, then bishop f8. So I'm still 60% sure that this is theory. The end game is supposed to be slightly better for white, but people like Magnus know how to make a draw here. Um, and that's a lot of Grandmaster level for you, right? It's like you get a positions where, yeah, objectively you're a tiny bit worse because our pawn structure is definitely inferior. We've got more weak squares, but our position nonetheless is quite solid. Bishop f4. Okay, that makes sense. So again, we can't play rook d8 because of knight c6. So I propose a move that at least temporarily freezes the knight on e5 and gets the bishop out of the um, purview of the rook. I, I think bishop d6 is a very natural continuation here. This makes a lot of sense to me. And of course, uh, uh, knight d3 runs into rook takes d3. So he goes g3 to defend the bishop. But that seems like a blunder to me. If I'm not mistaken, that seems like a blunder. Huh. That would be great if I'm playing blunder. <laughs> if I'm playing blunder, if I'm playing Magnus. Now, anytime you have this construction, that's a very dangerous situation. If anytime you have a minor piece that's not protected by any pawns and is pressured by two different pieces, um, you have to, you know, your tactical alarm bells have to go off. And if the bishop on f4 can be distracted, that knight's going to be lost. And, and you can do that by playing g5. Now, white is not entirely lost yet. Bishop takes g5, bishop takes e 5 White does have rook takes e5 and limit, limits the losses to an exchange for a pawn. But an exchange in the end game is incredibly dangerous. So this is definitely a mistake. This is definitely a mistake. Let's see if he spots rook takes e5. Magnus, bl <laughs> Magnus blunders, that's right. The game is very far from over. I think if White plays the ensuing end game well, it's going to be uh, quite difficult for us to convert. But this is a good start. Yeah, rook takes c5 is the only move. Otherwise, white's down a piece. f4 is not effective. The bishop has plenty of squares along the long diagonal where it can protect the rook. He plays it. Okay. Now an important decision where to put the rook. And we're starting to get into the level where these relatively minor decisions really start to add up, right? And you don't just want to ignore the subtlety of it. Now, first observation. We are under no threat of getting checkmated. Why? Because we have a rook on a8 that is essentially permanently guarding uh, the back rank against mates, which means that we don't have to bring the rook back to e8. We can use this rook and activate it. We can move it forward, and we can use the other rook in a semi-defensive posture, if that makes sense. Rook e2 is quite natural. And then the other rook we can bring to e8, potentially preparing a trade of rooks. Okay, c3 is... Um, that's a dicey move. That blunder's a pawn, I believe. Yeah, that blunder's a pawn. Of course, not bc, but rook takes b2. cb rook takes b4. Still not over. He's got very active bishop, so we'll have to be precise. But now we have a passer, and that's a, a huge deal when you're up in exchange. Because ultimately, white shouldn't be able to stop it with the material he has. Bishop e7 is... Sort of a, a paper tiger kind of move. It, it's not dangerous. Um, generally, our, our strategy here is to push the C-pawn. And one thing people forget, when you're up in exchange, you have two rooks against one. One incredibly effective method 
of um, it's like the presidential convoy, you know, protection. The, the Secret Service rides in the back and rides in the front. Uh, and that's what you do with your two rooks. You put one in front of the pawn and one behind the pawn, which essentially guarantees full passage for the rook. So rook c4 is not the only move, and you could play rook e4 with tempo, but I want to show this concept. I mean, trading rooks would be the ideal scenario, but it's, it is it is hard to force the trade of rooks, and you shouldn't be... This is a common mistake, actually. When people start to devote all of their resources to trying to orchestrate one particular trade, and if you waste too many moves, your opponent's going to improve his position. It's hard to, to force the trade of rooks here, unless you can give a check somehow. Extra of course it's desirable. I mean, rook against bishop is just easily winning, because the bishop it will be totally powerless to stop c5. And in general, when you're up in exchange, most of the time, trading one additional pair of rooks favors the side that has the rook. With, you know, exceptions, of course, but the reason is that neither the knight or, nor the bishop are sufficiently long range of a piece. They cannot move side to side quite as easily as the rook, and the rook can start mowing down all these weak pawns, particularly if you have a bishop pawns that are on the other color square. Okay, king f1. Now, rook c8 is unnecessary. We can begin by pushing the pawn, and rook c8 is not going anywhere. Furthermore, this is a bit of a trap. If he continues along this path, he's going to lose the bishop with rook e4 check. Yeah, 1600 blitz, probably he is underrated or provisional rapid. That would make a lot of sense. Yeah, and the anti-martial has been played three times at the highest level in the World Championship, so... Okay, bishop f6. Yeah, and uh, how should we proceed, folks? Yeah, either rook c8 or rook c2. Very good. I like rook c2. Rook c2 is a nice move. It, it puts the rook on an ideal square. It paves the way for the pawn to reach c3. And again, rook c8, no rush. It, you know, if, if white's rook was on b6, for example, then yes, we would want to go rook c8 because he would be threatening to put the rook behind the pawn. But as long as there is no rush, we just proceed along with along our, our plan. Next two moves, c4, c3. Even if rook b1, we can play c4, wait until the last possible moment. Okay, so again, we make sure that there's no mate here. There's no mate. After c4, the rook can swing to d4, but even if the rook gets to g4, that is totally innocuous. We just go king f8. There's almost never an actual danger to get mated here uh, in such situations. He just doesn't have enough pieces. Okay, so c3 would be an extremely instructive mistake. c3 would be a very typical mistake. It would allow the rook to get behind the pawn. And this is the perfect time for us to go rook c8. Okay, does that make sense? He's, yeah, check, king f8. Rook h4 here is probably the nice, the best, uh, most resilient move. And when you're up in exchange and you're trying to push a passer, there comes a time, most of the time, when your opponent tries to distract you by going for some of your other pawns. And you have to make the judgment call of when you essentially start giving away pawns because you judge that your passer is unstoppable. And generally that moment arrives sometime when your pawn is on the third rank, which it is here. We also have to determine that if rook h4, c3, rook takes h7, that may seem very concerning because there is a mate threat there, but we can defend against it very nicely. Okay, he doesn't play it, but... Before we move on with the game, who can tell me, if white's rook is on h7 here, how can black defend against the mate threat? King e8, very good. King e8, rook h8 check, and the king walks out to d7. Bishop g7 allows our king to move toward the center, where it's entirely out of danger. So, king e8, king e7, whatever. King d7, king d6. Uh, the only very tiny point I have to make is king d7 maybe allows bishop f6. Preparing rook e7 with check. Although even that is totally innocuous because our pawn will be already on c3. So yeah, it, it really doesn't matter. And yeah, generally I want to put the king on the opposite square of the bishop so that there are no sudden bishop checks. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. King. In fact, in a classical game, I would go king d6, rook d4, check king c5, and just get the king as active as possible. Maybe even get it to b4 and take the pawn on a4. So... A rule of thumb that I've said is that you want to keep the rooks on different color than the opponent's bishop, but that's not a, a uh, you know, that's not a law. If you can ensure that you're not blundering forks, 
uh, then you're more than welcome to keep your rooks on the same color square. It just marginally increases the risk of a blunder, but risk of a blunder is not an actual reason not to play a move. Like, if you can't play with the understanding that you're going to blunder. Okay, rook f4 is a good move. I mean, very resilient defense. So we have a choice here, right? We can go king e6, or we can judge that, yeah, you know, we can give up essentially all our pawns and still be winning. And I think that that moment has probably arrived. The only issue is that if we give up all three of these pawns, and then he gives up his bishop for our other pawn, he's going to have four pawns, uh, four passers for the rook, which is, you know, not the most elementary of the wins. But I still think that it's it's worth going for it. I just feel intuitively that we're probably going to keep our H pawn alive. That's what we're going to try to do. Now, where should we go with our king? Yeah, we should go. And I'll show why I didn't like king e6 after. So we have two options. We can go king c6. That's actually quite a smart move. With the idea of rook f6, check king b7, preserving the a pawn. Or we can go king e6, rook f6, check king e7, rook takes a6, and then we move the rook away and promote our pawn. And it probably is going to transpire that he's not going to have time to win the h pawn. So let's go king e6. That's more forcing. And now king back to e7. Now, uh, several options. We can give him a check and then go c2. But if you want to be nitpicky, I like rook a2 here. Why? Because after rook a2, although it is a little bit slower, he's not stopping the pawn anywhere. Right? We don't need to play fast here. It's not a race. I mean, it is. But after rook a2, there's no going to be no way to stop c2, c1. And at the end of the line, we're going to have a rook on the second rank. That's incredibly valuable because then we can later bring our other rook to the second rank. Does that make sense? We essentially ensure that once he gives up his rook for the pawn, um, okay, king, I guess king f7. And that's going to be inevitable. Our rook is going to be poised to combine with the other rook and hunt after his kingside pawns. Yeah, of course, he can sack the bishop, but then we're up a rook. And we'll probably cling to the h pawn as well, just to make it a little bit easier. Yeah, he does do that. Now, the interesting thing is we don't need to. We can go king e6 here. And after rook takes h7, we can go rook f3 and we start mopping up all of those pawns. In fact, I like that approach because the king gets centralized. We, we really don't need to. If you calculate, you'll see that rook h7 is no longer dangerous. Rook f3, rook c2, also, of course, possible, but our rook's going to get to the second rank anyway. It's over. If he tries to run with this king, king g2, rook takes f2, king h3. He drops not only the h pawn, but also the rook. The power of two rooks on the second rank on full display. It's over. Well, Nate, the whole reason I gave up the h pawn, and that's the reason I left this rook on a2. You guys see what I'm saying? If, if in this position, you know, the rook was on a1 and the king was on g2, I wouldn't be so, so quick to give up the pawn. But this is over. Yeah, king g1, and now... You know, the, the simple, the winning method here is very simple. You just move the rook away as far as it'll go, and mate is unavoidable. Notice how the king dominates the rook. The king just totally dominates the rook. And now we zigzag our way toward the rook. The point is just to stop rook f6. That's the only way to stave off mate. Um, and it's over. That was a very high-quality game, I think, by our opponent. With the exception of one blunder, I think he played very well. But that's just the reality of chess. <laughs> In G6. Yeah, I think it was a very high accuracy game. Okay, so let's let's start. So E4, E5. Now I'm going to go quickly down the opening. I would say that in, in general in the speedrun, you guys are responsible for educating yourself on opening basics. So for example, if you're sitting here saying, I've never seen the right Lopez. I don't know why he can't do this. That's something you can very easily look up online. Um, and I don't want to just, you know, make this about basic opening explanations when that exists by the base in full. But here the point is queen d4. This is the one thing I will say. And white, black recovers the pawn with interest because black is, white is forced to lose castling rights. Okay, so bishop a4, knight f6, castles, bishop e7. And by the way, this is more accurate than starting with b5. This is well known. If you start like this, then d4 is a very nasty sideline. 
So it's better to start with bishop e7. Rook e1, b5, bishop b3. And my main move is d6, which leads after c3 castles. Now, the history of this line is interesting. Um, in, in Capablanca's day, uh, people played d4. But then Capablanca against Marshall actually showed that bishop g4 is very strong. Then people stopped playing d4 for a very long time. And in the last 20, 25 years, people started playing d4 again because it was discovered that, in fact, this is not the end of the story. White has either d5 here, uh, which Gadakomsky really likes to play. That's his pet line. Or the main move, bishop b3. Knight takes d4. There's bishop d5. And this is an incredibly sharp and very interesting line. Uh, and if you're looking for, you know, an interesting sideline in the main line, R R Lopez, this is very much uh, valid. And the reason that Ruy Lopez is, is so incredibly hard to play with white is partially because compared to openings like the Vienna or the Fortnite Scotch, black has a ridiculous amount of legitimate sidelines. And, and it's very hard to study. You know, Daria Schwierz recently wrote a two-volume series on the Ray Lopez. Each book is like 300 pages. I mean, we're talking about the Berlin, the Schliemann, all of the A6 lines, which are a million, Steinitz, delayed Steinitz, the Casio, which has become popular recently, the Smyslov, the Archangel, the Moeller, all involve different developments of the bishop. And, and, and the Open Rui, which, uh, books have been written just about this line. So, yeah, knight d4 is even a move which has to be studied. I mean, it's it's an insane amount of theory, which is why when you study the Ray Lopez, a lot of it has to be understanding-based. You're not going to remember all of the theory. You have to study the sharp lines specifically. Oh, there's also the delayed treatment. So moves like f5, you have to just know. But in terms of these, you know, more positional lines, a lot of it is understanding-based. The briar, yeah. So this is not to mention... The fact that this is considered, one could say, the main line of the whole Rui Lopez. You know, the entire opening, this is maybe the tabia. And in this position, black has seven or eight valid lines. My main move is knight a5 and c5. This is called the Chigorin variation. Even within the Chigorin, there's deviations. The Briar is knight b8, incredibly reputable move, rerouting the knight to d7. The Zaitsev, rook e8, or h6, which frequently transpose. There is, I, sorry, there is uh, bishop b7, of course. There is bishop b6, a rare move that I played against Ferruccia recently in the aim chess tournament and drew. Mr. Wrench with the sub. There is even the move a5. And I've even seen queen d7 played uh, since the 60s and knight d7. So it's crazy, but mainly the Briar and the Chigorin are the main lines by a country mile, closely followed by... Maybe not so closely followed by the Zaitsev. I guess I contradicted myself. And, you know, if you want to avoid all of this with white, one way to do that is to play d3 here. This is a far less theoretical sideline, which was incredibly popular, particularly recently. And I was talking about this with my friend. Something really interesting has happened on a broad scale in the last 5-10 years in terms of top-level opening preferences, which is, paradoxically, this might sound ridiculous, until I explain it, that there's been a almost a departure from the most principled lines. If you look at tournaments in 2005, 2007, even toward the end of Kasparov's career, around the early 2000s, everybody was playing Nidorfs, people were playing Grunfelds, people were playing literally the most theoretical lines, and you had these 30-move theory, theory games. Um, now, of course, that still happens to a degree. I'm not saying it never happens, but... If you look at the opening choices, we have tons of Italians. The Italian is known as basically the most non-theoretical top-level opening because of the amount of different move orders and how positional it is. You know, the Berlin endgame, of course, is theoretical, but it's it's also kind of conceptual-based, and tons of people are playing the anti-Berlin, which is the move D3. So you see the shift where people are just trying to get fresh positions that are not even they're not going for an objective advantage they're going for positions that they know better than their opponent and i think magnus is largely responsible for that because he is the originator of this kind of philosophy where no i'm not necessarily going for the biggest advantage i'm going for a position where you know if you make a mistake you're going to be much worse so there's practical pressure and a position which i analyzed and you didn't um not necessarily the computer's top choice in every position or the line that that tries to to make you so 
just sorry for the uh, you know for the long detour, but I, I feel like that's an interesting trend and something you can kind of observe uh, as you watch super tournaments. And, and the Nairof has dropped off considerably at the highest level, even though not, nobody has refuted it. To the contrary, the Nairof's theoretical standing right now is among you know the best it ever was. Um, and I think it's bled. It's bled to the lower levels. You know, there is a trickle down effect. Now, at the lower levels, you have different openings that you have the same general trend where tons of people are playing the London, right? Tons and tons and tons. Tons of people are playing the Italian. Tons of people are playing, you know, D4 based openings more so than 30 years ago when everybody was playing King's Gambit at the beginning level and the Scotch in these openings. Less of a trickle down effect, but still, you can kind of observe that. Thank you, Shane Kane. And of course, Danny Wrench has influenced all of it. He is responsible for chess degrading into what it is right now. <laughs> um, okay, so back to the game. Marshall. So A4 is the anti-Marshall. B4, D4. B4, D6. All right. So again, I can I can talk about the theory for hours here, but... Suffice it to say, we're following the main line. Yeah, so I'm looking at the opening explorer, and it looks like D takes C5 is um, it looks like D takes C5 is more popular. Interestingly, I misremembered here. Oh yeah, and then Knight BD2. So for some reason, I was worried about you know A5 Bishop A4 in these positions, but uh, I guess it's not a it's not dangerous. You guys can explore using the opening explorer feature. Um. But taking with the knight is also a move. Okay, this is rare. Only eight games with queen takes d8. Most people deviate from the queen trade with queen e2. And ultimately, I think white's slightly better. I don't remember how Carlson Nepo went, if they followed this line or not. I mean, ultimately, it's just that black has weaker pawns, as I explained. And white has, you know, the c4 square and the c5 square. If you look at the queen side, white has a positional advantage there. So definitely, I would prefer white. The main move is bishop c5, rerouting the bishop to a better square, bishop g5. Oh, and there's the move bishop g4. Things get a little bit sharp. We're there's two games that went like this. Let's see which two games. Oh, Burkic Tkachev and Furman Klovans from 1975, both Grandmaster games. So, very, um, you know, very, uh, very strong line. I mean, <laughs> tons of GM games in this line. Okay. So, Queen takes d8, rook takes d8, um, knight d2 still follows some games. Sorry, one sec. Yeah, so we're still following a bunch of games. Bishop b7 is a novelty. Most people have played bishop c5 here with the idea of meeting knights. Oh, I missed this. What is black's idea? I, I completely forgot that knight c4 isn't really even a threat here. Knight e4, very good. It, and the point is that bishop f2 is threatened and this walks into back rank mate. So, yeah. The study plan took me a year to build. That's an interesting feature. Even I was not aware of it. That's the real problem. It's not that, it's not that the tools don't exist, it's that most people don't want to use them. So, I guess bishop b7 is not the ideal way to stop knight c4 because he plays it anyway. And, whoa. And we get into this... Knight takes d5, bishop d5, rook d5 position. Yeah, and I think so far white has done everything perfectly. But uh, here it's it can get a little bit dicey because we're threatening knight h5 and g5 is a, is a problem. So g3 is the decisive mistake. What do I think white should have done here? My guess is that there's multiple moves. First of all, this is a blunder, as I, as I said during the game, because if rook takes d3. But white has to be very careful. Who can give me an example of a decent move here? And maybe even bishop f4 is inaccurate. Maybe maybe this walks into unnecessary trouble and white should just like drop the knight back to c4 or something. But it white is obviously not losing here. Yeah, so one approach is to go bishop g3. And this makes the bishop defended. It does kind of walk into rook d2, which is a tiny bit nasty. Um, Knight c6 doesn't work. That's a good try. But after bishop f4, remember the knight defends the rook here. So no. Hmm. I would guess rook ad1 is a move. Just go rook ad1. 
Black cannot go knight h5, and if black, whoop, no, that's not good. If black takes and goes knight h5, no, but this is also very nasty. White actually is losing the game here. G3, G5, wow. So it's somehow not so easy for white to uh, to disentangle the pieces. I, I guess bishop g3 is the best move. And after rook d8, thank you, boosted. Maybe just rook ac1, cold-bloodedly defending, then moving the knight back to chase the rook away from d2. And it's just interesting how in chess, you get these positions which look totally innocuous, and then all of a sudden, things become incredibly dicey just over one move. And this is a product of undefended pieces. And anytime you have an undefended piece like this, and the 995 is loose as well, it's not undefended, but it's not well placed. You just have to be incredibly alert to this, to these, uh, to, to these turnarounds. Yeah, H3 might also be very good. But then I was worried about rook e8. I think no, h3, rook e8, and the knight cannot be defended. And if knight d3, then still rook takes d3. One true Maddie, thank you. Ooh, hot take by Danny. Okay. So g3, g5, and the game is over. Um, not entirely over, but for all intents and purposes, it is. I, I mentioned that it wasn't so simple during the game, but now that I look at it with a fresh pair of eyes, I, I feel like. White might have to go like this. And then after we activate the other rook, we're threatening to trade rooks and we're threatening this. Sorry, rookie two. This is just no bueno for white. And after c3, rook b2, it really is over. We're just up a full exchange. We've got a passer. And again, by using the technique of putting one rook behind the pawn and one rook in front of it, we ensure a clear pathway for pawn. And there isn't much to analyze. Yeah, so king, king e2, there's this fork, so use tactics to your favor. Rook c8, of course, is very important. c3 is very sloppy due to rook c4. And I find beginners to blunder like this very commonly. They think that this type of position is winning for black, but remember, this is the only rook that's defending the pawn. Whoa, and wrench with the 10 gifted subs. I just abuse him with my words, and, and Danny responds by gifting 10 subs. What a mensch. <laughs> Damn girl. Damn girl. Tanny with the subs. This is a very wholesome moment. Toxic streamer. Um, toxic streamer trashes leader of company. Uh, the latter responds with gifted subs. Thank you, D4NYYO, for the prime. Give me your primes. Uh oh. We got some one up and going on. Champ with the 20 subs. Oh, oh, oh my lands. What is going on today? <laughs> oh my goodness. Is this one of those 10, 20, 30, 40 things? <laughs> All right. Relax, guys. This is crazy. Okay. No comment. Thank you, Champ, for the 20. It's all about one upping Danny. And Kavita, one, two, three with a 10. Oh, no, no, no. Al with a 10. Anu with a 10. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. What is going on? Kavita and Al simultaneously gifted 10. Then another 10 by Anu. Oh, my goodness. Look what you started, Danny. Look what you started. <laughs> Holy smokes. Look what you started. Unbelievable. That's 40 subs in three seconds, and Jason sucks at chess with the 10. Oh my god. Oh my god. This is the ultimate poggers moment. The ultimate poggers moment. This is why I stream. Thank you so much, folks. This is amazing. Amazing, amazing. Yeah, we'll see about an encore. I was planning to eat. But, I mean, I guess that can wait. Let me just finish analyzing. I've been so rudely interrupted by all these gifted subs. So, Rook C8 here. And not fearing... Thank you, guys. Much appreciated. Not fearing uh, Rook H4 here. Right? Because we can go C3. Or Deer Mile with a 5. <laughs> oh, my God. Rook takes h7, and now we just calmly walk out with the king. King e8, king d7. And the last thing I wanted to show, thank you, Beer Mile, is that, okay, we give up the pawn here. 
We give up the other pawn. Rook a2 is an important move, actually. Rook c1, in my opinion, is far less accurate. King g2, c2. And this is what I was talking about. What you end up seeing here is that white takes the pawn on, on h7. And even though you promote to a queen, uh, in this version, white keeps all four of the pawns. And the win is far from easy. I mean, really far from easy. You can park the rook on f4 and white starts pushing the pawns. I've seen swindles happen like this. Of course, black is winning here, but tremendous accuracy is now required. So accuracy until the end in these end games is very important. So again, why rook a2? Why is this different? Although this is slower than going rook c1, uh, it ensures that after we promote, the rook is going to be on a2. It's going to be poised to pressure the pawn on f2. Well, hopefully you understand the logic here. Bishop f6, king f7. He decides on bishop takes c3. Of course, probably bishop g5 is more resilient. But ultimately, I mean, you can't go here because of rook a1. So, and rook f6 is a useless check because of king g7. All right. So, king e6, rook f3, and that's it. All of the pawns fall with checkmate. Great game by our opponent. I have to say, once again, there was just one mistake. And other than that, he played a very, very clean game. 